as you can see, we have a lot of different appearances of lung cancer on uh, chest X-ray. So you can only imagine we have just as many, if not more, on CT. So here to review that with us is Dr. Leo Zur, who's here from uh, from New York City. Oh, I don't need notes. No. Good morning, everyone. So thank you to Caroline and David. This program was so beautifully designed that you're going to see me reinforce themes that both Debbie and John discussed. So with that, let's get started with the typical appearances of lung cancer. And this lecture in a short 15 minutes is kind of what I wish everyone would have told me before I became an attending and came across these pathologies. So unfortunately, most of the lung cancers we come across present at advanced stages. We only are catching about 18% of lung cancers when they are local, and 22% of them already have spread to regional nodes by the time we pick them up. So these are two cases of stage four lung cancer, and on the left, we see that there's lymphangitic disease, loculated malignant pleural fluid, and then on the right, this is a different patient with diffuse metastatic nodularity bilaterally. Of course, typical appearances are a mass because we are catching most of these cancers in advanced stages. So if you remember John's lecture, you see the left upper lobe peaking, or sorry, the left lower lobe air peaking into the left upper lung region, and this is due to left upper lobe post-obstructive collapse because there's an endobronchial lesion. So this is our lufsicle. This is a typical appearance. And the contralateral companion case, we see our right upper lobe lesion. We're almost at the centennial of the golden S sign and the post-obstructive S of the atelectasis. So again, these are typical appearances, unfortunately, advanced presentations. This is our hilum, which we see we can't make out any hilar structures, so it is a hilar convergence sign, and there's mass in the hilar and paratracheal regions that then extends into the lung, unfortunately. So those are our advanced stages, but then there are that 18% that we're picking up through screening. So typically, what do we expect to see? We expect that this nodule is going to progressively increase in size and have this normal expected growth trajectory. But how do we know when it takes off, when that rate of increase is going to suddenly accelerate? And so we see here between 2020 and 2021, it more than doubles in a year. And that's really the importance of the annual nature of screening. So nodules that are solid have one sort of rate pattern, and subsolid nodules or ground glass nodules may progress much more slowly. So yes, the trajectory is still an increase in size progressively, but now it's over 24 months, this doubling in diameter. So typically these lipidic or ground glass predominant lesions will grow more slowly, and these are adenocarcinomas. So this is the spectrum of primary lung adenocarcinoma. So not only will you have nodules increasing in size, but typically lung cancers that are on the adenocarcinoma spectrum will increase in density. So you have your atypical adenomatous hyperplasias, and those can only be up to five millimeters. So those are tiny and only ground glass. Then you get to AIS, which and that can be larger, but it's still pure ground glass. Then when you get to minimally invasive adenocarcinomas, they can have solid components, but not larger than five millimeters. And invasive adenocarcinomas, we're worried about those when the solid component is five millimeters or greater. So that's when these patients are usually typically going to biopsy. So this is an example over almost a decade of what is an ground glass nodule that increases in density and size, develops spiculation and pleural tags, and this is a primary lung adenocarcinoma. A nodule can also increase in complexity. This is a mixed solid cystic lesion. In a year, we see the cystic component is increasing in size. That's a big no-no. LungRads 2022 says, hey, when you have these cystic components that are increasing, or you have increasing ground glass, or you have increasing solid component, so anything that's increasing, you take your pick, that's bad. You upstage. 
and this is in 2014. Look how much more terrible in only one year. This again is adenocarcinoma. So we have various models that tell us what we find to be a suspicious patient feature or a suspicious lesion feature. So there's a Brock model, and in this model, there are some patient factors like older age, female sex, family history. Then there are some other risk factors like emphysema, a larger nodule, an upper lobe location. I mean, if you think about it, that's where the emphysema is usually. Part solid, because I just showed you several examples, and those are typically adenocarcinomas, and having less nodules. So imagine a case of granulomatous disease. You have 100 nodules, but those are not cancer. But these few cases I've shown you are those very suspicious lesions. And then things like speculation. So this is an example of a suspicious cancer. It's part solid. It's in an upper lobe location. And then we also need to remember regions of fibrosis. Lung cancers like to grow in these already damaged areas of lung. So this patient had a left lung transplant, and cancers can accelerate because patients who receive a transplant are on immunosuppression. And so cancers also like to grow in areas of fibrosis. So this is a right lower lobe lung cancer in a post-transplant patient. And these cancers are two times more common in post-transplant patients than our regular screening population. So summary of part one of my talk. Typical appearances, unfortunately, advanced stages. Mass, plus or minus these classic centennial signs of the golden S, cervicothoracic, hilum overlay signs, and then nodules that are progressively enlarging in size, density, or complexity. Now we're going to go to kind of the more interesting part, some zebras, but atypical appearances or presentations, things that we need to have top of mind when we're looking at these CTs. This was a 51-year-old man who presented to the ER, and he had a consolidation in the right lower lobe. We see air bronchograms. We see some volume loss. It looks like a pneumonia, but we need to follow everything up to resolution. This was a primary mucinous adenocarcinoma, which presented as an unresolving consolidation. So just as John said, we need to make sure that consolidations are not persistent. There's a difference between persistent versus recurrent, and so that sequence of exams is quite important. This was a case I came across my first year as an attending. The left-hand image and the central image were from this 70-something-year-old man. He came to the ER. He had a fever, multiple consolidative opacities, right lung in a patient with emphysema with a fever, follow-up to resolution. This, is, this could be pneumonia. So patient comes back. This consolidation is much more dense. And we know that increasing in density nodules are bad, and I'm pretty sure increasing in density consolidations are even worse. And there's direct osseous involvement with this lytic destruction of the adjacent rib. This was multifocal lung adenocarcinoma. This is a patient who presented to us during COVID. She was COVID positive. She had bilateral airspace consolidations, which were that kind of subsolid nature. So in the right upper lobe, it was more severe. But then there's patchy opacities and left upper lobe involvement. We said follow up to resolution to make sure there's no persisting subsolid abnormality. She comes back six months later. She was only 55, 56 years old. Left upper lobe got better. So yes, there was COVID there. But the right upper lobe looks more ominous. There's more density. There are pleural tags. There's now extension to the pleura. Everything else in the right lung has increased in density over just a short six months. So very scary. She went to bronch, primary lung adenocarcinoma. Not only can you have multifocal consolidations, but you can have multifocal nodules. Oftentimes, these ground glass nodules are transient, and they go away, and they're infectious because you have a, a bunch of them. And that's a great thing, right? In our Brock model, less nodules was worse. So sometimes lung cancer, especially EGFR-associated lung cancers, can present as multiple subsolid nodules. And these are multiple synchronous or primary lung adenocarcinomas. So these are each their own independent actors. Maybe the left upper lobe wants to progress faster than the right upper lobe. These will not progress in unison. 
Whereas if you have a process like lymphoma, usually that will progress in unison. So lymphomas can also present as subsolid nodules. So these are all primary lung adenocarcinoma lesions, and the EGFR mutation is more common in women, non-smokers, and those of Asian ethnicity. Very indolent progression. So several of my cases, when I became an attending, I saw these patients with 20-year patient jackets, and we were looking at nodules over decades. And that's a lot of priors, but guess what? That baseline is your friend, and I mean the baseline for that lesion, so not necessarily the patient's baseline. This was in 2004. They followed this nodule year after year, and if you look at successive exams, it didn't change much, but when you look at an exam from 15 years ago, I think it's much more obvious to us that it's more solid. This was a primary lung adenocarcinoma. Nodules can also contract. So I showed you the typical enlarging nodule, but guess what? Sometimes nodules don't read the book. They don't follow their trajectories and they can have paths that dip and rise. And so this nodule actually decreased in transverse dimension and we could see this blood vessel is now contracted in towards it. And why does that happen? That can happen with increasing lesion complexity, fibrotic alveolar collapse, or increasing soft tissue. But I have some better examples of contraction. So if you just measure a nodule in your report and you say, oh, decreased in size 2.2 to 1.3 cm, let's not worry. Well, I don't know, what about the density? It got smaller, but it's much more dense. This is another case of a primary lung adenocarcinoma. So numbers are not only what we go by. So even in lung grads, if you have suspicion, that can up upgrade anything. So it's really our personal judgment that comes into play and what we have to explain. This is probably one of my most surprising cases. I was. For some point in my career, I did lung biopsies, and this patient, she was an 80-year-old woman. She had altered mental status. She had brain metastases, cerebral edema. Neurosurgeon says, what's the primary? I want you to biopsy this right upper lobe nodule. It's presumably a cancer. So she comes. She's an inpatient, so that's why we see her four days later. This is her intraprocedural CT. And I mean, that's a big decrease in size. And there I am, I'm like, really? It's decreasing in size. She has something infectious or inflammatory. But she's already on the table, and they need proof before they go to the OR. We biopsy it. It's a primary lung adenocarcinoma. Now, remember I said she had brain mets and edema? She was on high-dose steroids. This nodule, and no one ever told me this could happen when I was a resident, this nodule decreased in size because she was on high-dose steroids. Lung cancers can have inflammatory components that respond to steroids. Now, now you know. So, cystic lung cancers. If I saw the right-hand image, this is a patient that I biopsied as well. I would have thought this was a cavitating lung cancer, but guess what? This actually began as a unilocular cystic lesion, and as it progressed, we see that it increased in complexity, size, ground glass, solid soft tissue. The vessels are pulled in towards it. So another case of lung adenocarcinoma. So we saw in areas of fibrosis, you can get cancers. In areas of emphysema, you can get cancers. You can also get scar carcinomas or scar mimics. So this. You know, we see that pleuroparenchymal opacity at the lung apices, and we see periosteophyte fibrosis. I don't really appreciate many osteophytes here, but I'll tell you this was called periosteophyte fibrosis for about 10 years. This patient was coming in regularly for aorta surveillance because they had an aneurysm. Now, what are some abnormal features in retrospect that we should have called out? Fissural tethering, this kind of odd shape without an osteophyte. So they come back four years later, and now it's increasing. I feel like there's some cystic change here. Again, I don't see an osteophyte. The fissure is still abnormal. And now four years later and eight months from our initial, there are convexities, there's solidity, and I think now I do see an osteophyte. But this was a lung cancer. <laughs> so, you know, beware. Beware. Don't propagate what you see in a prior report. We're all free thinkers, and this is the most exciting part of my job, getting to look at something with fresh eyes and making a difference. Airways. Airways, David Nadich, 
he, I share an office with him, that's my claim to fame, and he said airways are king. I never had the pleasure of training with him, so I start reading every CT going through each of those airways, and if you went through each of your airways, you would see the superior left lower lobe airway is blocked. Now, patients may cough, maybe that's mucus, Okay, patient comes back a year later. I don't know if this person looked at the prior, but isn't it a little suspect that the abnormality is in a similar location and that airway still looks abnormal? I think that's suspect. So they said come back, short interval follow-up, maybe it's pneumonia. Well, I don't think pneumonia increases in airway involvement, and now there's no plane between the aorta, there are no air bronchograms, and this was, of course, a cancer, unfortunately. So look at those airways. Airways are in lung rats 2022, and for a good reason. The more proximal the airway is, the more bad it is. Again, another thing I wish they would have told me. Can you have a primary lung cancer that's non-small cell without a lung nodule or a lung mass? Yeah, who knew? So, this soft tissue infiltration, prevascular mediastinum, maybe we think it's some thymic carcinoma, but there's such a small area of pedividity. When you get the MR, you really appreciate that enhancing soft tissue is terrible. This was primary lung adenocarcinoma infiltrating into extranodal mediastinal tissues, no lung lesion. Another example, this was an external CT, so I don't have better images. Another non-small cell lung cancer, enlarged nodes, you know, a normal person would think maybe this is lymphoma, something like that. No, not lymphoma. This was primary lung squamous, no lung nodule. Plural presentation. Sometimes things are not mesothelioma, they're unilateral, and this was lung adenocarcinoma with multiple of these necrotic pleural masses. This was the patient's initial presentation. So typical in that it's advanced stage, but atypical in that it's really primarily a pleural process. There are other things that are atypical, and these include unexpected demographics. How old do you think this patient is with minimally invasive adenocarcinoma in the right apex? She was 31 years old. There were small solid components. They f so, you know, let's look at Fleischner. That starts at 35. If you look at other societies like Asia or the British Thoracic Society, there's no age cutoff. I mean, you're an adult at 18, and there, there we go. We'll, we'll treat you like an adult. But I think we don't want to be too sensitive. We don't want to overdiagnose. But if something's suspicious, it's suspicious. So unexpected demographics, they could be atypical. This was a neurosurgery resident. He was 30-something years old, very young. He presented with altered mental status. They were concerned for a perineoplastic syndrome. So this was, at the time, this was not my biopsy, one of my colleagues' biopsies, and they were hoping it was sarcoid, a unifocal sarcoid that for some reason you have a perineoplastic syndrome, and unfortunately this was a primary lung adenocarcinoma. So unexpected demographics are unfortunate, but I think we've all seen in the news colon cancer, earlier ages, and these things are happening. We need to figure it out. And I'm not saying overdiagnose, but let's make sure we are thinking about all possibilities to provide a service. Multiple malignancies. Yes, it's nice when we have a unifying process, but sometimes patients can have multiple things going on, and lymphomas can also have ground glass, as can different metastases, like melanomas, pancreatic obiliary most commonly, and mucinous cancers. So this patient, she had multiple malignancies, and she came to us with multiple biopsies at various times. This is another patient, two images from her right upper lobe and right middle lobe. She also had multiple malignancies. Now, this is our summary now, atypical appearances, multifocal consolidations or nodularity, indolent or unexpected growth trajectories, scar or radiation-induced carcinomas. If anyone has an example of a radiation-associated cancer, I looked for that in a breast radiation field. That's very, that was very hard for me to find. Unexpected patient demographics, unexpected or less common locations. These are some references. Some of the cases are from some of our publications. And this was a pleasure. Thank you all so much.